Okay. Welcome everyone. We're here in Carbondale, Colorado, the home of the Nuch, the Ute people who have guarded this land for many years, guarded the lands and the waters. I'm Rita Marsh with the Center for Human Flourishing. And I'm here with William Evans, retired physician who lives in Carbondale, who's invited you to a talking circle on the relationship of human keystone species to source. This is going to be an interactive exploration of organizing our water in the collective benefits of life sustaining choices. Will. Thank you, Rita. We breathe and have life. Welcome. We are thankful for our mother, the earth, for she gives us all we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Now our minds are one. I give thanks to my teachers and ancestors, especially those who help me reconnect with source and organize my water to see the big picture. They explain one of our purposes as a creature on this earth is to work with change in a beneficial way. That is one of our gifts as a species. Indigenous people have long held in high esteem those creatures able to benefit balance within their watershed and relationships. Stop sharing. Okay. Thank you for being. Kindly tell us who you are and where you are. Stephen, why don't you go ahead and. I'm Stephen Emmerich, and I'm in Dayton, Ohio. Greetings. Hi. I'm Rita Marsh. I'm in Carbondale, Colorado. Hi, I am Taylor Howe and I am in Chicago, Illinois. I apologize in advance, my video camera has been going in and out. So I'm definitely here and listening, but I might not be visible the whole time. Well, we, we have our own share of technical challenges here. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we are happy to see you Taylor and we'll look forward to hearing from you if you disappear. As a species, we have the potential to align our hearts and minds with source, to create a unified commitment, a cooperation with source committed to living in balance with a living world story. And our focus in this circle is keystone species and specifically human keystone species. The modern scientific understanding 
of the biology of keystone species began with this man, Robert Payne. We're gonna take a breath here for a minute and see if we can get Robert to join us. <laughs> Okay. These sea otters precede Robert. He's coming. There he is. Robert Payne is a zoologist at the University of Washington in Seattle. He respectfully approached the Macaw Nation and obtained permission from them to study an eight meter stretch of shoreline on Tatouche Island. And when he removed a sea star, a single species from the intertidal zones, the creature's absence had a profound effect on the ecosystem. Sea stars feed on creatures at the edge of the ocean. And a keystone species plays a large role in an ecosystem, meets its needs, and has a beneficial effect analogous to the role of a keystone in an arch. When a keystone is removed from an arch, the arch collapses. When a biologic keystone is removed, the ecosystem collapses. The balance, diversity, and vitality of the food chain collapses. Before I spoke with Bob Payne, I talked to other conservation biologists and zoologists. Each of them was very kind. We spoke at length. And in most cases, on multiple occasions. And finally, I ask each of them a question. Can human beings be a keystone species? <clears throat> and each of them responded with a single word, no. Then I called Woody Morrison, having fun here with his family as the clan elder. He was trained as an indigenous Haida history keeper. And he responded to my question with telling stories, story after story. The old men of his village had trained him. And there was no doubt, Woody was raised to see both the big picture as well as details to give back to Mother Earth, to always see ways to give back, to work with change in beneficial ways. He was raised to evoke and maintain a healthy balance. He understood my question, told me stories. However, Woody never used the word keystone species. Indigenous people are like water, the most powerful and the most humble of all our relatives, flowing equally, rooted in the confident authority of their right to be. Although they know how to benefit water and change and have words for maintaining such qualities, we seldom hear them. For example, the old people warned Woody about a worm that can get into our minds and convince us we need something we don't need. It's called skuju, and the worm is greed. A short time later, I read 1491 by Charles Mann, and he wrote, until Columbus, Indians were a keystone species in most of the hemisphere. 
Native Americans have been managing their environment for thousands of years. In a talking circle, we speak one at a time and only on the topic or issue at hand. Today, we speak in a positive way about human keystone species. When it's your turn to speak, silence is always acceptable. And if you choose to hold silence, stay with it for a few breaths, then simply say, I pass. Listen with your heart, speak from your heart, be brief and spontaneous. I speak from my own point of view, how the issue will affect me, my family. I do not agree or disagree with any other participant. I listen. Tell us from your perspective, how as a human being, you evoke balance in relationship with source. Stephen, would you start? Well, greetings to other bodies of water and breath. And thank you, Dr. Evans. And I do remember your name because I am made of water and we know that water has memory. We know that also the ocean breathes and the water and breath is life. And I see that as keystone, a keystone fabric woven together, water and breath. So I think of circles like this and balance with source as a convergence of covenant, of a covenant with water and air from which we came and to which we go. And that it's made a bequest of us to not only honor it, but to shelter it as it shelters us. And I think that that covenant between us and water and breath was made long ago, and it calls us to be faithful to this balance of water and breath with source. As long as I find I remember that, I'm in balance because I'm woven as part of that. As soon as that worm gets into my head, it withdraws me from that cord and I'm spinning and spinning. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak and say, all the water and all the breath that's joined the circle today is sacred covenant converging in this conversation. And thank you for the honor of being part of it. I hope. Oh. And, and see you, but we'd love to hear from you. Hi, yes. Um, I actually have just started reading Circulating water, Source Water. So what stood out to me, especially in the forward, um, was the fact that we are water people. It's, it's kind of a, a light bulb moment for me hearing Dr. Will talk about all humans walking the earth, our containers of water, each of us born with a purpose. We are not accidents. We are here for a reason. We need to find what we are here to do and do it. Um, so in, in regards to the question around how I stay connected to source and, and continue to tap into that, punctuating my day recently in the city with moments of quietness and reflection has really helped me just remind myself of, of what I'm here to do and what my purpose is. And, and I'm really excited to continue reading this book and to discover more about, honestly, just this whole concept is quite <laughs> a massive light bulb for me because I it's the, my first introduction to it. So um, there's one more part in this forward that I highlighted. We are in a time of change to regain our balance. We must become centered 
and quiet enough to listen. And that's something that I think has been really, really helpful for me, especially with what's going on in the world is, is to try and find those moments of quietness, especially in the city to remind myself of, you know, why am I here? What is my purpose? Um, so thank you for, for having me. Thank you. Rita. Thank you, Will. It's an interesting question. How do I as a human being evoke balance in relationship with source? And for me, it's through awareness, through being present with the land, being present with the water when I go on walks, being present with water when it comes out of the tap, when I wash dishes, being present with it when I, as a privileged human being, have water shower me and feeling that cleansing. So for me, it's the awareness of that connection and feeling so grateful and so privileged, as I said before, of being on this planet at this time and having the time in my life and making the time in my life to be present and to nurture that awareness. Uh -huh. For me, one of my first real powerful experiences was as a child because my father was a fisherman and he gifted me a childhood on lakes and rivers. And there was no agenda other than just to be and to play. And memories came back and learnings followed. And, and one of the profound learnings for me was uh, kayaking and learning to touch the wave with my paddle rather than paddle as hard as I had, had been in my uh, anxiety. And when I did that, the stability and the partnership with the river began to, to grow. And so along with, with that experience came a realization of how much is enough, how much effort and power to put into a paddle stroke. And it kept growing. How much is enough? How much water do I really need? And when I've had enough, my body tells me I'm, I'm not thirsty anymore. With us, we also have Joni Matranga, and she can <laughs> she can come into the picture quite easily. And Joni, tell us what you would say. Um, you know, I think it's here. I'll, I'll sit up higher. I think balance in this day and age is really a hard thing to maintain. And for me, I have to be in nature and it really helps to be able to see the snow and the, the rivers and the water flowing. And, and uh, I need to be in touch with the earth, but I also need to be uh, quiet in this time. It's really disrupting what's going on in the world today. And so in order to maintain this balance, I have to be quiet. Um, I have to think about gratitude. Um, I think it's so important to be, have gratitude for everything that's been given to all of us here and, um, and to hold it as precious, to, to value it as uh, something that's been given to us by our ancestors 
that we need to continue and to be able to share with young people. And I wonder how I'm ever going to reach people that just don't see the world like we do. And so how can we touch them so that they can appreciate and have gratitude for each other and for all of us? Um, so my balance is really rooted in nature, I would say. And uh, Will's been teaching me about water, but uh, I used to go sailing a lot. So I know a little bit about that. And now I do other things with water, but um, it's so important. And I'm so uh, concerned about our lack of precipitation and climate change. And I mean, we've seen this in other parts of the planet. So it's not like we're the first just it's our turn. Okay. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say something. So Stephen, we want to go around again. What would you uh, what would you add to the water flowing through you in additional words? As I'm sensing the current of conversation here, I love the language of uh, Taylor of punctuating the day, of taking time to stop and ground oneself to remember in quiet and stillness. I think it was the poet David White that said, I become an apprentice to silence that we take that time and I have received tonight from this so far that it's only in that stillness and quiet that I hear my breath again. And in hearing my breath, feeling my breath and knowing the water that's in it, in that quietness, which leads to a feeling of a another word that's come up so far in this circle of being privileged, a new definition of being privileged, right? Of being privileged because it's precious, water and breath is precious and life. And therefore we are precious one to another because we are water and breath and air, not because we possess something, but because we are precious. And out of that comes that, for me, a new definition that I'm hearing tonight of what it means to be privileged. That's transformative to me. As long as I remain grounded in that understanding in my heart or sitting in circle like now, I feel that profound privilege of being in the presence of other bodies of water and breath and knowing then you came from where I came and I came from where you came and we are family. If I see it as possess, then what I can do can contaminate you by what I think or what I say in my harshness or poorly worded comments. So I want my inner water, as you say, Dr. Evans, my inner waters to be clear. I want to pay attention to that and my intention of sharing that with others, knowing that that reciprocity between one another is so profound. So I take away tonight, punctuating the day with that kind of quiet place that grounds me again in that sense of precious privilegedness of being present with water and breath in the company of circle. So thank you. Oh. It might be my turn to, to go, yes? Yes. Or to contribute. Um, I, lately, I think 
from working at home and, and really it just being me and my thoughts and me kind of versus me, I'm having to break down, I, I don't know if you'd call them societal norms of how things should be done, quote unquote, or how people should interact or what my workflow day should look like. But I think what, um, and if I'm getting this question correctly, what I would like to, to add to this body of water that I am and hopefully contribute to the other bodies of water that I am engaging with so frequently via Zoom, maybe hopefully in real life someday soon, um, is to kind of drop all of these preconceptions of, of what I thought stuff should be and to kind of relearn, you know, how does my day flow? How can I exist in harmony with, with people? Um, it's quite an interesting time to be, to be, I guess, to exist with um, just everything that's going on. And I, I think I would love to continue learning how to just break down the pre-existing ideas of, of, of how someone should exist. Um, it's been quite challenging for me to, to repattern certain behaviors and ways of existing that I might've grown up around and coming back to the idea that we are bodies of water and what I am is kind of what you are, which is um, really beautiful is, is something that I'm excited to continue trying to unpack. So I, I feel like I have quite a long journey ahead of me, but I'm excited to be starting at the age that I am and, and hopefully we'll be able to share with more youth, you know, um, what I learned from these circles. So thank you. Well, Will, I appreciate what you said about your youth and your father introducing you to water. I grew up in Muskoka, Ontario on a lake and my youth was spent in the summers in the lake, immersed, wrinkled skinned <laughs> at the end of the day. And of course we had a canoe and learning to paddle was one of the arts my father passed on to me and learning to read the waters and learning that water can be friendly or not friendly depending on the wind reacting with it. So I thank you for that because that uh, allowed me to, that memory to filter in and to fill my body with beautiful, beautiful energy, uh, feeling the water in my body relate to that memory of youth. And the question of today about the keystone species and how as a human being, do I realize my role as keystone species? And relating to water, um, being in the West, I'm very, very aware of the dearth and the drought we've experienced. So treating water as a precious commodity is, is essential in my role as keystone species. And there was recently, well, this last weekend, an article on the Colorado River in the New York Times about water as a commodity. Very, very challenging to read since we live on this land and, and see the effects of water dwindling in our riverbeds, in our streams. So I so appreciate this conversation and appreciate, Will, your contribution to the topic of water with the beautiful book that you've 
published. And I hope you'll speak to that before we end our circle today. Thanks for the inviting me to be part of this conversation. Thank you for being. Well, I started this morning, um, sat down to, to see what was happening and um, try and connect with Raleigh. And in the course of that, opened an email from a woman named Elizabeth Harold, who's doing 12 hours of, of programming in this seven days of rest. Uh, today on water. And it was a lovely start to the day. And several people spoke. I didn't speak, but I, I looked out the window at the mountain. And the realization of what a gift for those of us who know Carbondale to live in the presence of that mountain and look up at source and see the snow accumulating there and know how precious it will be this summer. I too uh, saw that New York Times article that people with a lot of money were realizing how profitable it would be to buy up Colorado River rights. And I closed my eyes, I uh, opened them up and reconnected with source. Um, maintaining my balance is probably the most important thing I do because I, I had a friend yesterday tell me she doesn't listen to the news. I, uh, I'm tempted to behave that way, but I think I need to know the truth. And yet I need to let go of that information after I've got what I need and get myself back in balance and start functioning and, and making choices that benefit me and my grandchildren and the community where I live. And to live in the proximity I do to source is obviously a great privilege, but it's, it's also a responsibility to speak about it for those who don't get to live in, in a visible connection with source. Joni? Hmm. Well, I was thinking, um, I, tr I, I don't pray every day with the Shume people, but every day there's a vigil that uh, happens at 10 o'clock on Zoom uh, from the Pasadena Center where they chant and, and essentially pray for everyone who is having a hard time struggling in the world today. And uh, this chanting uh, brings me in touch with, uh, I would say, my spirit and a higher spirit uh, and it's very calming to me so that i'm able to um, let's say listen to the news or interact with people who are difficult for me um, better than i used to i mean i i think uh, this balance is so critical but by doing this prayer, I'm able to think about other people, you know, thinking about other people in the world and how their life is and and trying to pray for their happiness and, and that they have peace and harmony in their life. 
And I remember that um, I grew up in a place that wasn't very affluent. Uh, and, um, and there were a lot of happy people there. I mean, <laughs> we were happy living our lives there. I mean, things weren't always easy, but we were happy. And so this idea of, of letting go of the way you think everything you should have or what, what, you know, what you need in life, what you need is, uh, is inside of you. And so you have to, or I have to, think about uh, this environment that I live in. And I, in my work, I worked um, uh, to, on solutions for climate change uh, through my uh, career. And uh, it's been very, it, it was uplifting in how much we accomplished, but it's been so um, depressing in that we have so much more to do and so much further to go. And we need so much for people to come together and make, as the, a lady said the last time we were doing a circle, we have to make the choice. Each person in the world has to make a choice for Mother Earth first and not everything that we need. But it's hard for us because we live such a privileged life in this, in this country and, and in this world. So um, it's just something that I struggle with in, in, uh, in my work and what I do and how I live. And I know that uh, it's important to stay, um, stay in the environment and to respect the earth because we do so much damage to it. And Will's book's interesting in that and that he shows you you know, what we've been doing and then talks about how we should be. And I think that's really helpful for people who are not in touch with all the things that have happened in the last 40 years, let's say, in terms of environment and our world. But we have to study history because if we don't, uh, we, we won't have learned from the past and we have to learn and not so not to repeat our mistakes. And uh, in Sy what happened in Syria and in the Middle East this, this past four or five years, I mean, all of that with ISIS was, was because of climate change. I mean, they had drought, they didn't have water. And um, we have to really put our priorities in the right order here. And uh, it's about being a community and being protective of our environment and our water and having the people that are in the market want to buy up our water rights and dry dry up the zones of Colorado so that they can build more houses and have better developments on the front range isn't really a holistic solution here but we don't have any other paradigm that we're accepting except what we're talking about and what Native people know about. So I'm hoping that our new Interior Secretary will, will be very thoughtful in her presentations to all of us and, and hopefully a great guiding light. Stephen, where would you like to go from here? We can play for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> and Lucy's <is> very happy. <laughs> or even five minutes, and we, you know, and then we can talk some more. Well, let me first say that the, the music that I'm hearing is the learning to read the waters. As a psychologist, I've had a number of years to learn to read the waters when the water broke 
when the water would break in a session and something would cascade down in terms of change and transformation. So I'm quite moved by what I'm hearing and in that breaking of water in circle and to learn to read that because you, I am what you are and you are what I am. But it requires, if I'm going to understand that from the punctuating of the day and that privileged new definition, I have to be willing to release pretense. And if I can do that with the aid of water and breath, I can find the presence of source. And then there is a cascading that happens. Just like Keystone Species says, if you remove one, it can affect and collapse an environment. There is also one that when that Keystone is respected, cascades down through the whole dimension in a transformative way, just like when water breaks in a new birth. So I'm really touched by the circle and language that's happening about water and um, the, uh, the feminine in me is very happy with the breaking of water. And the, and the man in me is learning not to be afraid of that. Oh. So as long as water is a commodity, it doesn't require any consciousness. It just requires dollars and cents. And John Moore said, whatever's dollarable is a problem. And yes, so that I must remember that consciousness does require that dropping of pretense and the living in presence, living in the present. And I've heard, heard people speaking tonight of where you grew up so that that's why I believe water has memory. So that when we speak this, I remember I grew up a lot of summers in Virginia as a little boy in a place called Big River. I have no idea if that was its real name, but it was big to me. And I remember being able to submerge and lay a bit down into the bed of the river and be able to look up for just a moment and see the sky and see the fish at the same time. Mm. And something cascaded there too. Um, there was a breaking of the water and it was magnificent. So these rivers, um, these mountains that, that feed the rivers, this absolute magnificent sense of as long as I let that punctuate my day, I'm going to be at peace. So thank you. I hope. I Kayla, are you still with us? I am. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm definitely still here. And it's um, it's really beautiful to hear Stephen and you know everyone involved just talking about their own experience and upbringing and tying it into source water. Um, I am thoroughly enjoying just kind of being a sponge over here and absorbing all of the beautiful things you have to say. So I, I don't necessarily have anything else to contribute at this moment in time, but thank you all for, for sharing your wisdom and well, seriously, thank you for sending me back to Chicago with this book. I, I feel like I need to not need, I am really looking forward to finishing it and then being able, I think, to contribute kind of my, my thoughts around that. I'm still totally in the forward section of the book. So I think I need to dig in a bit more. I'm 
I'm feeling very full and very nurtured by this conversation on this day of epiphany in the Christian tradition, January 6th. Um, and a significant day in this country of America. And I'm just feeling drawn to going into quiet and prayer for this country and all of its peoples and all of its waters, all of its mountains and all of its first peoples who nurtured the land and the waters before the visitors from across the waters came. So again, I'm grateful for this opportunity of conversation in circle. Will? Yes. As I think about your presenting, my strategic mind does a count of how many people are in circle and evaluates whether it's enough or not, whether it's good enough or not, whether it's sufficient enough or not, the strategic mind. But in that silence where that water flows from source reminds me that if we in, reintroduce the wolves into Yellowstone after 70 years, could start with a very small circle of wolves, will come to change even the rivers themselves. So I'm touched by the power of if there are four, there is a circle. And if there are four, there's a river. And if there's a river, there's a mountain. And if there's a mountain, there's always source. I love that we are who we are together in circle. And I hope you do this again. Well, I don't know what keystone species are capable of because I haven't been educated the way Woody was. But one of the, the recent conversations I had with him was telling me about how the people on the street where he lives up in Canada would come out at, um, I think it was seven in the evening. This was the start of the first lockdown and, and people would come out and play musical instruments and sing and Woody would take out his conch cell. But what he talked about was everybody coming out and caring about each other. And, um, for me, one of the great gifts of this pandemic has been to slow down enough to listen, and that includes listening to what my heart is telling me, but also what other people's hearts are telling them and what they want to tell me. And um, so it's a it's a strange and painful opportunity, but it seems like uh, uh, also an auspicious time for our appreciation and our thankfulness for the indigenous people who held this place in balance for so many thousands of years to inspire us to uh, begin to turn around the uh, the wreckage and change course.
Joni, do you want to uh, probably start the close out and say your final words and whatever else you'd like? I just hope it snows a lot this winter. <laughs> And it doesn't look like it's going to do that, but I hope it does, because we need all the water we can get this summer and spring and into the next year. We don't we don't need another problem, and this is a big problem for us. We need water, and uh, I just want some peace in our country and in our land and in ourselves. So um, with that, it's all about water, isn't it? If we don't have water, we're not going to drink, we're not going to eat, we're not going to ski, we're not going to grow anything. It's just all about water. Um, so um, I think, Steve, you can uh, play music anytime you want, and then we'll close us out. And I think we have, uh, you have a few minutes for us, I hope. This flute is a flute that I received just yesterday. It came from Bethlehem and a block of wood brought back from Israel by my daughter. Oh, nice. And that was four years ago. It was given to her by a carpenter in Bethlehem. And I gave it to a carpenter here to make this flute. And it was so moist inside, the carpenter had to wait four years for it to be sufficiently dry to make this flute that arrived yesterday. So to all of the trees that hold these rivers and this music, I'm grateful. come to know the patience of waiting the years for the song to arrive. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Joni. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will. You're welcome. Thank you. Will, can you tell us how you can be contacted if people want to follow up seeing this recording at another time? Sure. Um, we have that information on a slide that's coming up. Uh, just allow me to share the screen. Have to see it. I can tell you while we're getting the slide, I'm at box 242, Carbondale, Colorado, 81623. My phone number is 970-704-0124. 
and my email is drwevans at soprisnet Okay, now your host, Joni. Okay. You can put that slide up. It's the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Travel in beauty. Be safe. Be healthy. Be happy. And then I 